Hello, mother <laughs> Yeah, good morning. <laughs> this summer trip sucks, boys. G'day legends, I hope that you're having a fantastic day. Now today's podcast is with Danny. Danny spent a number of months in Ukraine, both fighting and training the local forces. Thank you, Danny, so much for coming on the podcast with me. If you like this work and you'd like to support what I do, there's links down below, but never feel obliged. Thank you very much. Enjoy. Bloody bad, 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 bad. Oh, bad. bad. <laughs> no, I mean, it's like this. <laughs> Someone open that package. Danny, mate, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast and your beautiful dog behind you. Who's 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 the dog? <laughs> that's uh, that's karma. Karma. That karma. Yeah. Well, some some dogs are are karma. Is karma good or bad? <laughs> uh, she's a little bit of both. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fantastic! No, look, mate. Um, thank you so much uh, for joining me on the podcast. Um, we've been trying to tee this up for a while, and I've been stuffing you around. But I'm so glad. I'm so glad <laughs> to meet up and do. Uh, this. Can you just tell us about yourself and I guess what your background is serving? Yep. Um, I joined the Marine Corps in '99. Um, that shows my age a bit. I turned 42 like this past July while I was in Ukraine. Um, Paris Island for a boot camp. Then um, went to Marine Combat Training, uh, Camp Geiger. Um, went to the Fleet Marines, served till, well, 9-11 happened, of course. Then um, a lot of people started joining up. I uh, did one deployment. I was uh, with 2nd Marine Division at Camp Lejeune in North Carolina. Um, got to see a little bit of the sandbox. And after that, I, I got out while the getting was good, I thought at the time. Oh, right. When when did you leave the Marines? Uh, late 04. Yeah. So I had, when, when I went to Ukraine, I had been out in the military for about 19 years, believe it or not. Oh, shit. Yeah. And, and how was that like transition, I guess, from being like, I've been out now, uh, two and a half years. How was that like transition back into that sort of environment? Did you slot back in or was it a bit like, Oh shit. No, it, it, um, man, it was an easier fix than a lot of things I've done in life. Um, I, I stayed, you know, pretty, pretty recent on like the rifle range and pistol range and stuff throughout life. Um, I grew up in South Carolina and also Texas, so outdoorsmen, uh, you know, hunting, camping, et cetera. So um, getting back in that in that groove was was actually like a round peg going into a hole. Nice. And, and what were you doing in that like nineteen year gap? Uh, so I was uh, when I when when the war started, I was a broker in Florida, um, made great money sitting in an office and um, just relaxing, you know, surfing, taking life, taking life as it came, man. And uh, I just seen too much crap on the news to where it kind of pushed me back to that direction to, to be willing to, to volunteer. Yeah. I, I seem to get that a lot from guys that I speak to is they're like, I saw X event on the news. And for a lot of guys, I think it was like Butcher Erpine uh what like those you know massacres and the invasion into that area of you know north of Kiev, that that was the trigger point for a lot of guys was that was there a specific point for you when you're like i need to go yeah um it was a children's hospital it had been rocketed and, and uh just watching out i'll never forget watching it in daytona and just seeing the the innocence and you know the tears the civilians and seeing that it was senseless and being told that he's targeting those places, then it became not a war, but a massacre in a way. And uh, that, that was one of the final things that pushed me over the edge. 
And when was that? Was that right in the beginning? Um, no. See, that would have probably been. I'm going to say it probably about a year ago exactly now, right around maybe um, August, September of last year. Oh, shit. Something so like that. So a fair, a fair way into the conflict. Yeah, a fair way into it. Um, I'd watch a little bit of it, but, you know, in my mind, I'm an old man. <laughs> what am I going to go over there and do? Um, it wasn't a war that I was really well-versed in. Um didn't understand a lot of it. And it, it was after seeing so many civilians being, you know, targeted purposely, that's when I started looking into the war and studying up on it, finding out the background, et cetera. Yeah. And then that drove you to go. And and what was, I guess, your initial plans of going, like with your family, with whatever happened from there? Um, what, what do you mean? Like, how did I tell everybody or? Yeah. And, and like, at, what point was it like, right, I'm going and this is what I'm doing. I've got to buy this equipment, do whatever. Like, how did that all come together? Almost like the logistics of it. Um, <laughs> it was kind of a shit show. I'm not going to lie. Um, <laughs> I, I started looking into it and uh, seeing that, that foreigners could volunteer, you know, and um, foreigners could go fight. So I just, you know, figured I'd be a regular infantry guy. And um, I was down with that, looking forward to it. Uh, I had a BMW that I'd purchased. Um, you know, I owned it. It was paid off. I put it on Facebook Marketplace and uh, asked a, a few thousand dollars less than the value of it just so that it would go quicker. And I actually had a guy drive from uh, Atlanta, Georgia, down to Daytona that day to buy it, brought cash, because I told him, you know, I want cash, first come, first serve. And after I got that money, that's what I used to buy, you know, my plates, my plate carrier, everything else that I was going to need. And um, told my my mother, my 73-year-old elderly mom, you know, like, hey, I'm, I'm going to Ukraine. I'm going to volunteer. And uh, she had been through it, you know, me, me leaving before when I joined the Marine Corps when I was way younger of a man. And... Uh, she she handled it pretty well. She understood why I was going. She understood, you know, what what I believed in and what I wanted to do. And and she was behind me. And um, within about a week, I had a plane ticket out of Fort Lauderdale and flew from here to to um, Amsterdam and then to Poland. Oh shit! First time that side of the world. Yeah, yeah. First time that side of the world. Shit, it's different, isn't it? Like between yeah, the states yeah. and. Like, I think Australia and America is fairly similar feeling. And then I go to Europe and I'm like, well, it's like different humans here. It's a very different, <laughs> especially like East, Eastern Europe. Right, right. And what was your, like, expectation rolling in? And did that, like, live up to it as you, as you like, first crossed across into Ukraine? Um, I, I, I didn't plan it very well. Like, I, I was kind of playing it by, playing it by the by my nuts, man. Um, and when, when I got into Poland, I'd spoken to a guy that had already gone over there and he told me what border crossing to use. And I, I remember stopping about a click outside of the border because I didn't know what I was going to go into. I didn't know if I was going to cross the border, be picked up by the military, immediately go. Like I, I, I had no idea the, the logistics of everything. So I stopped about a click from the border, put on my, my uniform, my plate carry and all that. And then when I got across to the other side, luckily there was a, a banner up um, that said International Legion on it. And it was two like 16 year old kids there that could kind of speak English. And um, they asked me if I was a soldier, said, yeah, obviously, yeah. And I, I, I spent like an hour there. Then they took me to uh, an abandoned school and then from that point to another point to another point, it just built until I was in training. Shit. And, and what did that training consist of? Um, Like a refresher, pretty much. Um, I mean, we, we did cover things that I didn't do in the Marine Corps, like, uh, like how to clear trench and things like that. You know, things that you use in this war that, that in U S wars, we haven't really had a use for, um, a lot of, uh, you know, rifle drills, live fire, um, clearing bunkers, clearing trenches, setting position, 
things of that nature. Right. And how long was that period before you then rolled up to like missions on the front line from there? So you, you train for about about a month and a half. Um, then you would you would deploy to the front. Um, let me see, when we started training about a month and a half, something like that. Then we deployed. So about from getting into Ukraine to a mission, right around a little over two months, I would say. Yeah, right. So you've you've got a fair like a fair taste for the country and a refresher on training in that amount of time. Like if you've done it before to pick it up, that's pretty quick. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. And where did you go from there? Did you, when you rolled out to the front, did you go if a year ago now I'm thinking, I know there's a lot going up in Kharkiv and Kherson. Where, where, where did you deploy from there? I, I was, um, I was probably about 30 clicks outside of Kupians. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was mainly, you know, for a long time in Ukraine, you do a lot of defensive, you know, holding the line. You, you, you go out, you're out there for about 48 hours and you get a position, you hold it. And 48 hours later, you rotate out with somebody. Yeah. And what was your first sort of taste of, of combat in that war? Um, hold on one minute. I'm going to grab a water really quick. Yeah, for sure, dude. All right, I'm back with you. So, um, first taste of war would have been late February last year. Late February, maybe even like the first week of March. Um, just hold, holding the line, like I said, the, we were occupying an abandoned village um, outside of Kupiant. And... We would uh, team up with these Ukrainian units. They would send out a group of a, uh, you know, a group of us from the legion, paired with Ukrainian units. We would go out, do like a seven click infield to position. You'd get position, then you'd hold it. Um, a lot of artillery, a lot of drones, things of that nature. Yeah, and how was the artillery? Because I, like a lot of the guys I speak to, they just cannot believe like the sheer quality <laughs> of, of the artillery going back and forwards? Um, artillery. So that's something, you know, a U.S. guy hadn't really had to go through before. And it don't matter if you've done 10 tours in Iraq, Afghanistan, where, where you get mortared every once in a while, things like that. Sure. But, but the artillery in Ukraine is, I try to tell people when they say that they want to go, like just, you know, be prepared. Like, this is what you're going to have to deal with. This is going to be the biggest thing on you mentally. Is, is I mean, Russia's got artillery. They have a large amount of it, and it's it seems like it's never ending. And is it direct? Uh, yep. Yeah. They use, um, you know, they use the drones. That's <laughs> a lot of guys from this war here in a, a Walmart, you know, $99 Christmas drone is going to be something that, that will mess with them for the rest of their lives. Is, um, just that they, you know, they use drones, they use the live feed to, to use, you know, as a spotter for the artillery, which will just keep it moving in until they get it on pinpoint. Um, a large, large amount of it's direct and, and it's something that you got to be prepared for mentally. Yeah. And there's not much you can really do for that, is there? No, there's not. There's, uh, you, can, you can hold your breath and just hope that they miss. Yeah. That's about it. Yeah. Fucking hell. And how was the sort of first impression of that when you first went to the line of like, what did you feel? Was it, was it chaos? Was it just disaster? Uh, I mean, it's, it's a little bit of chaos. I, I remember, uh, we had this lieutenant, um, it was a Ukrainian lieutenant on my very first mission, and they had just gotten in from Bakhmut um, and just seeing the way that he would react because we would be, we had a position to my left 
with uh, my buddy Badger, and then me and Shaka were positioned on the right, and my buddy was with the, the Ukrainian lieutenant, and uh, you would see him just pop his head out of his hole every once in a while and look around with eyes like that big around, and especially if he thought that he would hear a drone, which he thought often. <laughs> he, he would shh, shh, and point up, and uh, then he'd pop back in his hole and just seeing people I mean, he he had definitely been through a lot. Uh, his, his mind had definitely handled a lot. Emotions had, had been through a lot. And that was kind of like a, a wake up of where you were. And then that with the, you know, every three hours or so, they'd have a constant artillery barrage that would come in and go on for 20 minutes or so. And then they'd, they'd lighten up and in peace for a few hours. So it's a... Uh, it's something to get used to. I don't think it's something you can be prepared for. It's just something that you got to hope you can handle. Yeah. And were there many casualties like in those barrages? Were they successful with actually hitting guys? No, um, not, not earlier in my time in Ukraine like that. Um, later on, after I picked up the platoon IC job, uh, we held a couple positions that were just – I mean, you, you, you've got these holes that you're at, and when you go out on mission, like they, they've been under, you know, barrage after barrage just to where the tree line, the woods around is just devastated. There, there's no cover. We could literally watch the drone feed and see my guys, you know, you see their helmets moving around and stuff, and and it's it's a wonder that, that we didn't take more than casualties than we did. Yeah. It's fucking insane. And and how was your impression, at least initially, of working? So you're with the, the Legion, but working alongside the Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. How was your impressions of how, I guess, the Legion was and as well as, like, the Ukrainian soldiers? Um, uh, Ukrainian soldiers, great. Loved working with them. Um, I, I worked with the 92nd for, for the, the majority of my time there. Um, uh, great guys man and and a lot of them are coming from different backgrounds like you know bakers and uh delivery boy and stuff like that and their their country came to a time of war and and they stepped up and and that's one thing that i do love about them um the legion also great group of guys man and i can honestly say in this war i met some of the best men that i've met like soldier wise, um, a couple of them don't even have military background, just volunteers that wanted to come do a job when, when it was needed to be done. And that's, that's one thing that I love about the Legion is that it's guys that don't have to be there. They can be, you know, sitting on a beach in Florida if they want, but, um, they believed in something and they, they, they went over there to try to try to fight for a cause. Um, does it have problems? Uh, any military organization has problems, even the Marine Corps. Um, you got to take the good with the bad and uh, you got to make the most of it. Yeah. Uh, the Legion has been a bit in the news recently for having a lot of problems with torture, murder, uh, some, some terrible stuff that people are not getting paid, like on the less end of that. Did you come across any, any, anything like that, any like, like proper mistreatment. Like there's, I, you know, I'm an infantryman myself and I know there is, you know, degrees of mistreatment in, in things and belittlement, whatever, but to that sort of nth degree, did you come across any of that? Um, now pay is an issue here and there. Um, like me and my guys, we didn't get our last combat pay for a bot mode. Um, I think that's more of like a, I don't think it's an overall problem. I think it's more of like a, a unit level, like maybe even down to, I wouldn't say platoon, but probably company level. Um, with the like torture and murder and stuff like that, I never came across any of that. Um, again, I mean, you, you can't push it off as like, well, that's going to happen in, in war, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, I mean, you're going to have that. 
it's going to be hit or miss. If you're with people that are, are psychologically stable, mentally stable and sound, or if you're with people that, you know, enjoy doing things like that and have the opportunity. You know, I guess it attracts those sort of people, doesn't it? You know, it, it, you and I both know the, the military and you know, the Marines. I've worked with a lot of Marines um, and like the Australian infantry. It, it attracts a certain type of guy. Um, yeah. And I guess in the Marines and us, it somewhat gets filtered through the recruiting phase, um, bloody whatever it's called, your um, basic training, and then, you know, your further right. training. But even then, guys, guys leak through the cracks, and you you would have been in some units in the Marine Corps with guys who you're like, who the fuck is this guy with fifty knives? <laughs> uh, everyone everyone has the knife guy. Um, and I guess the Legion, you know, where it's you could probably speak on this further, but there's not that much filtering of guys. Like I know there's a few interviews and whatever, but it's it's not. It, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's not to the extent of like the assessments the Marine Corps would do. Yeah, no, it. it, it I think it comes down to more of a a need and a necessity to where they don't they don't have the time or the means especially during a war to to vet it like you're talking about you know and, and filter it through uh they do have the couple of interviews um they prefer if you're prior military that you bring your paperwork like for the us of dd214 things like that to just show who you are show what kind of service you've done um other than that though i mean they don't they don't really have the capability to 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 vet you too yeah. thoroughly yeah and how was the relationship between the uh legion and the ukrainian units um good uh we we, we got along with our our units that we worked with very well um a lot of them you know trusted us completely and we trust them, you know, you're, you're coming into these people's home country and their land and you're working with their military in their war. So if, if you don't have some level of trust going into it, then, then it's not going to, it's not going to work out well. Um, so yeah, me and my guys, we got along great with our counterparts. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. when was it, I guess you got into like the most heavy combat, you mentioned Bakhmut and around that time we know Bakhmut was a massive urn of everything going on. It still is like, I, I think yeah. this war, I think in uh, 50 years time, we will look at Bakhmut like a Stalingrad. Like I think, I think it will be that for such a small city, it will become so synonymous with a war. Like people will think of Ukraine and think of Bakhmut. Um, yeah. I don't think more people could say Bakhmut over Kiev at the moment. Um, how was like that? When was like the most intense fighting you got into? Um, so I got wounded going into Bakhmut on uh, August 8th. Um, Bakhmut and, and Bakhmut, it was my first time going into Bakhmut. Uh, we were on a night assault, uh, going to go try to capture positions on that, on the outskirts and right. I mean, on, taking the armor in, you could hear the already hitting before we even got out the armor. And then when it stopped and we disembarked, grabbed our packs and started to split up because we had two assault teams that were moving in. Um, man, it was, it was probably like half a click in that we just started taking such heavy artillery that, I mean, you could barely move. And I was with the first assault team. And when we had pushed forward trying to move up this road, <laughs> During, during the briefing, they, they inform you, you know, the, the field to your left is mine. Don't go in the field. The tree line to your right is mine. So don't go in the tree line. So it's like, so we just stay in the road, huh? They're just stay in that road and just keep pushing forward. And uh, uh, I had rounds hit near me and this uh, 23-year-old kid from the UK, Blaze. And I took shrapnel on my left calf and went down in a in a crater when that blast knocked me down is right by a burned out armored vehicle and my knee went down um did a number to my knee it swelled up instantly uh, i had a few puncture holes in my calf and and that was the end of the assault for me um bog mood now i i never got to see the inside of bog mood you know it had already fallen before we even moved down to that to that area but 
like you said, it's going to be one of the main things in this war that people look back on. And and when you talk about the Ukrainian-Russian war, Bakhmut will come up just like Fallujah in Iraq. Yeah, I agree. And I think, we, we well, not think, I know that we're going to see a second battle of Bakhmut. Like, because, okay. you know, Wagner PMC pushed through it and captured it, and then the VDV, and Ukraine's going to push back through there at some point. And... It's not flattened like it. Like it's just the city is completely destroyed. Don't get me wrong, but there's some new images came out only yesterday, and there's still enough there to have a ground war. Like, and it's going to be unbelievably savage when Ukraine pushes back through. It's going to be like okay. it was the first time, but worse. Yeah, the the, the rubble and everything around Bakhmut. I mean, it's and there's still, like you said, there's there's enough of the infrastructure left, like the buildings and whatnot, to where. I mean, it's going to be urban. It's going to be a lot of CQB and just things that are not good for combat. No, especially when, you know, as you know, like urban warfare, you know, doesn't favor like armored vehicles. It's going to be guys out there with, with guns. Like yep. U- Ukraine has the advantage on the armor at the moment, or at least in quality with the new stuff. But none of that matters if you're just out on foot. Like it's going to be who can get on the trigger first. Right, right. Who sees who's first and who's the better shot? It might be about the end of it. Fucking oath. And how was um? You said when you got hit by that um shrapnel from that arty shell coming into Buckwood. How was the um? You said there was a British British bloke with you, Blaze or Blake? How how did it was Blaze? There... Uh, Blaze, no, because you know it's important to keep your space and um so that one shell don't take out two people. Which this is a prime example. Uh, Blaze was. Blaze was walking in front of me. He might have been point, I think. I think he was on point. And then when we started taking the fire, um, we we held for a minute during the incoming. Then we started moving again. When I got hit, uh, Blaze did keep trying to come help me. I'll, I'll give him that. Brave kid. Uh, he was in the military in the UK. But uh, – my captain gave the order for us to pair back up with the second assault team. So when we started falling back, just because I was moving slower than Blaze, I ordered him to go up in front of me. And uh, the whole way out, man, he he kept yelling back to me, text, text, you all right, you all right? And uh, then we get back to this tree line that's mine, keep in mind, in mind. And we're trying to hide underneath these little, like, twigs. And you can hear the one drone overhead. So we're radioing in, you know, is that friendly? Is that friendly? Then by that time, here comes another drone and then a third drone. So you got three drones up above us. Artie, that's just getting walked in closer and closer. And and uh, we get word that, yeah, that drone is, that is a friendly drone. But at that point, when there's three of them, it's, well, you know, which one? Which one's friendly? So, uh, and then we sat there and just got shelled for a bit until the armor came back in. The armor got us and, and we withdrew. Fucking hell. Oh, it's good that he's all right. <laughs> yeah. And and how were you feeling at that time? Were you like, holy shit, like this is this is it for me? Or is it you know you still No. <laughs> um I if, wait, when you say this is it for me, do you mean like done with the war or Oh no, meaning like you thought you were gonna get smoked in that tree line? Oh no. well, I mean artillery. <laughs> Artillery is psychological too, a big part psychological because you hear that the actual you know fire boom off in the background, and yeah. you can already say like incoming, and then there's that wait period to where you're just sitting there, just sitting there, and and you hear that sh- coming in, and it's a butthole clincher. <laughs> it's the best way that I can put it. Is it is definitely a clincher. Um, I I don't think I've ever been at the point to where, like, I thought, oh, my God, like, we're going to die. Um, a lot of the guys from that night, just because the way the assaults went in the, the area of the front that we were, we were assaulting, said, you know, it's a lucky thing that we did pull out because we'd all be dead. You realize that, right? Um, so I... I don't know. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's it's a different war. It is yeah. a different war. Yeah. And was there any any points you came like face to face with the Russian soldiers? 
No, that I've not done. Um, other than, you know, there are a couple POWs that, that, uh, units that we work with took, um, it's, that's the one thing about this war too, is that, or at least me and my war, it was more of a World War One. you know, you're, you're stuck in a trench, you're firing pop shots back and forth, uh, that and mortars and artillery. But now as the, as the platoon I see, I did send out missions to where, and it was before we left the Kupiansk area, that our positions, like I was telling you about earlier, ones that have been just devastated to where there's no trees around and anything. Um, I've had missions go out, uh, let's see, Mailman, Call Sign, Call Sign Yado, and Jarvis. Uh, the three of them, their position got overran. We were watching on the drone feed because, like, whenever I would send out a mission, 48 hour mission, I'd try not to sleep. I'd try to stay up, stay on the radio just in case, like, we needed already something like that called in. But we're watching the drone feed, me and the Ukrainian captain and the little CP, and the drone goes over, and there's no tree line at all. Like I said, it's devastated. And they back the drone up, and we're looking, and you can see about eight Russians, 50 meters out, man, 50 meters out, sneaking through the trees right before it comes up mm -hmm. to an opening. And um, I radio in to, to Jarvis, Jarvis is a 21-year-old German, great kid. But I radio into him for them to tree line to the left, three to five shot burst, open up, then hold fire. And so they look over, they they open up, they give a little burst, they hold fire, and I'm sending a, a voice note to my captain. And I've got this audio, I can send it to you, but uh, Jarvis comes over the radio and you hear the machine guns going off in the background when they opened up on them. Sure enough, the Russians saw they had been spotted. So they started firing. And that turned into a, like a four-hour battle. Yeah. Um, we ended up losing that position that day. Uh, we had to fall back. One of my guys was reported wounded at first, reported 300, and then we got reports that he was actually KIA, but then a few hours later, he turned up with a Ukrainian unit that had had found him, scooped him up, and, and brought him back. Lucky so, yeah. Lucky boy. And you were watching this happening, like live feed through the drones and like sending information I, through. I feed, and, and that's, a, that's a helpless feeling. Um, you know, a lot of these guys, I'm old enough to be their dad, like literally, and... I, it, when I came to Ukraine, I didn't want any kind of responsibility. Um, even when they got me teaching CQB during uh, training back in in Western Ukraine, they uh, one of the instructors comes up and he was like, "You're a section leader here." And at first, I was like, "No, no, 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 no! Like, I'm not doing that. I don't want it. I don't want responsibility. I don't want it to be on me. Like, if something goes wrong." And uh, they assured me, like, no, no, you, you'll be fine. It won't carry over to the front. It'll just be while you're here. So then uh, I deployed to the front. Within two days, I'm a squad leader. Then, like, three days after that, I got on a mission. I come back. They made me the platoon 2IC. And then a month later, I'm the platoon commander. <laughs> so just it spiraled quickly. Okay. But um, a great group of guys. Um when you're when you're watching that on the drone feed though to, to back up to what you asked me uh it it is a big feeling of you know i can't do anything what can i do and that's the one difference that you can easily notice between an american war and what i was used to and trained with to to being out there is watching like that position get hit watching them have to fall back from position uh, I, I can't call in a, an A-10 or, you know, anything like that to help them. It's pretty much, you know, try to do what you can logistically with your Ukrainian counterparts and, and just pray that you can get them home. Yeah, and I guess that is too for the, for the medical aspect as well. Like there's no medevac. There. Yeah. Like as far as like Hazavac, like Chopper, that's not coming in. You, you're no. very much on your own out there. And I, I think you, I might ask you to speak on this. 
that a lot of people are turned away from this war because they go there with this thought that it is going to be a war like the West is fighting with everything from like the HR department through to fucking fighter jets and Kazavak and all this. And you're like, no, 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 no. This is two, this is two armies going at it, which you can't have those aspects. And this is an army that is, you know, not as fitted out as, as the Yanks. Yeah. Um, you know, people that think that there's going to be medevac and stuff like that. There's not. Um, well, they get you out now. They will. I don't want to make it sound like they just leave you out there. Uh, with with my platoon, I mean, there was a time that we, we had a man get hit. And in fact, on on the, the day the position got overran that day, too, that we would send out a QRF because you have a quick reaction force on standby, you know, at all times. Uh, you, you have a roster at just rotates and um you know we would send out a, a qrf to try to get to the wounded personnel get them out or whatever we needed them for and on the way in that qrf would start getting hit so bad that it, they would take wounded or it would just be too heavy a shelling for us to keep moving forward with the qrf and you'd have to pull them out or lose more guys and um I'd say the the worst aspect wounded wise is that some of the times, I mean, realistically in Ukraine, you might have to wait till after nightfall before we can get anybody in there to you. Um, of course, it depend on, you know, if you're heavily wounded, they might try something a whole lot riskier. But if if you can be stabilized, you might have to just suck it up for ten hours. <laughs> And is there ever like a commander to commander ceasefire across trench systems to come and get guys out or collect your dead? You mean with Russian and Ukrainian? Yeah. Because I've heard of a few, I've heard of <laughs> I, few instances of, I, of that, but I'm just, just asking from, from your uh, no, I mean, I've seen it in the movies before, but I, I don't I don't think that happens in Ukraine. Yeah. 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 Fucking wild. And how, how is your feeling towards the Russians? Like, is it, is it one of, is it one of hate? Is, is it hate towards the soldier or the political system, or is it just the war? I think it's really the leadership. If you want my just honest opinion. Um, I mean, looking at them as the enemy, because they are the enemy. I mean, there's no, there's no foggy line there, but I mean, a, a lot of them that, that you see like some of these POWs and stuff, you understand they're just kids, they're conscripts, they're they're forced to fight. They don't want to be there. Um they'll, they'll lay down a weapon, surrender as, as quick as they can. So you you feel bad and you you have the human side come out at that point. But then I mean there there are the others, there are the diehards, there are the ones that believe that they're they're for the right cause, doing the right thing and and we'll we'll keep going to the end. So you got to got to look at the Wagner type on one side and the conscripts on the other. But at the end of the day, it's it's who you're fighting. I don't think it's a I don't think it's a hate or a you know any kind of aspect like that in the field. It's just staying alive, keeping yourself alive, keeping your buddy alive. And if that's what I got to do to keep alive. And, keep him alive, then, then that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. That, that, and that makes complete sense as well. Um, yeah. especially I think as a foreigner going in and for those guys, you know, those like POWs who were, you know, young lads, um, conscripted or, you know, chucked in the deep end. Is, is there a level of sympathy towards that of like, cause I guess once the, once they've surrendered that they're, they're, you know, they're, they're now there. Um, is there a level of sympathy like these poor fuckers, man? Because I I have a level of sympathy, especially for like the the um, the conscripts in any war for any country, the conscripted guys. Because I'm like, holy shit! Like I'm I have military training myself, but imagine if you were just picked up off the street, 17, 18, right. into like, and I've been in nothing even close to like what the soldiers are in there. Like I've been at the front lines, a journalist, but it, it is it is different. Um, is there a level level of sympathy there for them? I guess once they're captured as peer ups. Yeah, um, I mean, I I have just like you said, I can't imagine just being a kid and being you know yanked up. 
either from your parents or because you're, you know, a, a runaway or something like that and, and thrust into a uniform with a rifle and said, go. Uh, you, you hear these stories about, you know, Russia barely even training guys or showing them how to use their equipment and stuff and literally just throwing them out in huge numbers because they realize, you know, if we send a hundred and five of you make it, then, hey, five of you made it. Um, so uh, the human side, I mean, yeah, it, it, it does feel, you know, feel horrible for people like that. But like I said a minute ago, I mean, it, at the end of the day, if it's my guys or them, then, you know, in a heartbeat, I'm going to pick them in a heartbeat. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And and how was you witnessed, I guess, the treatment of these POWs? Uh, I, I've never seen any, any really mistreated. Um, the only ones, the only POWs that I've really come into contact with were ones back in our, our village that were captured near the positions that got overran. Um, before we went to Batmu, Russia was really starting to pile troops up in that Kupiansk area, uh, just, you know, trying to push back and I guess retake Kupiansk. But, um, I mean, for a very small amount of time, the, the POWs were there before they were turned over for questioning and things. And, you know, after that, that's above my level and I never saw them again. Yeah, sure. And you asked, uh, sorry, you said about you monitoring the drones as, you know, calling guys in the front line. How, from your experience, you know, previously in, in the military to now, how important is that drone aspect of warfare and how do you think that's changed things? Um, drones have changed warfare and it, it'll, it'll never be the same again. Um, it, it it gives you that live feed. I mean, you know, back in World War II, Vietnam was the first war that was kind of televised and we actually got to see what was going on. And then it, it's been like that. All wars have been televised, Desert Storm, everything to where you, you get to see what's happening on the front. But until this war, you've never had that you know, front row seat to where you can literally watch troop movements. I spotted that Russian patrol coming in on my guys. I, I got to see where artillery's hitting so that we could try to adjust fire a little bit. Um, I think now that we've opened this door and they figured out how to use this technology for the means that they're using it, I don't, I don't think war will ever be the same again. No, I agree. And I don't know where war changes from here. Like, I honestly can't think of any single, like, weapon system that has come into a battle. And I'm thinking back to, like, the bloody, when you've had a fucking sword that has made this much of an impact on the front line, like, maybe a crossbow. But, like, it just seems, it just seems like such a thing that could change the dynamic of war. And I, I posted in my Telegram group today, like, if with these cheap drones, they're, they're accessible to anyone, really anyone in the world. How the anyone. hell are we going to do stuff again? Like if we went to <sighs> Iraq or Afghanistan and the Taliban or IS or one of these had next time we go somewhere like that, they will have a shitload of these drones. They know they work. And, yep. you know, I've, I said, I think in one of my posts in the last couple of days, I was speaking to a good mate of mine, um, Ex regiment guy, who was like, mm. we lost forty two. If if it was now, we would have lost four hundred and twenty because those drone that would be the first thing is the drones, and there's no real good way to counter them. I, was there any way you guys countered them? There, there, there really no. There, there is no way to counter them. And like you're saying about, you know, losing forty two, we lost four hundred and twenty. It's. All, all reconnaissance movements, you know, sneak and peek patrols, stuff like that. Those days are kind of done. Uh, you, you get thermal drones in the sky. It don't matter what you're doing. It don't matter how great your camo is and how slow and silent you are. You're going to be seen and that there's no way to get around it. Um, now, I've heard of people using shotguns, things like that. Uh, the main thing with the drone, if you can, is stay hidden not be seen uh if you're if you're at a position get inside the whole bunker whatever you're going to do 
Um, but just don't, don't, don't let it see you. Cause once it sees you, I mean, it's over with, um, other than shotguns, I, I really don't know too many ways to try to counter them. And I haven't even really heard great experiences on shotguns really doing anything for them. Yeah. Well, even a shotgun, like I'm, I'm sure you've gone, um, like shooting clays before, like mm. it, it's not, and they move a hell of a lot slower than a bloody drone does <laughs> and yeah. close. Like, you know, you, you might be shooting clays at what, 80 to 120 feet. I don't know. Something like that. Like, and, and a drone uh -huh. can sit so high. Yeah. So high and, and far off too. Um, that's another, like the drone screens that we have, it's like, you know, on a plasma TV and it's a bunch of little boxes and each little box is a different drone feed that you can click on. So you click on this one and that's the thing with a drone. Even if you shoot one down, shooting down that drone, I assure you there's going to be 40 other drones in the immediate vicinity and they're just going to route one right over that area. And now they know that you're there. So that's why I say with a drone, I, Better to hide if you can. If it don't know you're there, that's that's the best way to to counter a drone. Yeah, and and what is it that you've seen in your experience that Ukraine need the most to support them in their effort? What they need the most? Yeah. Mm. <sighs> that's a question. Um, I think that, and this is going to probably put my foot in my mouth, I think that some of the times, or at least the impression that I've gotten on the front, like during the offensive, it seemed like they would have things to spread out. Like if, say like if I was able to actually call in artillery in this area, then I wasn't going to have any kind of medevac or I wasn't going to have some other thing that needed, it's like, Artillery's over here, a little bit of air support's over here, your medevacs can be over here in these different regions. If they would just coordinate things, it seems that it, that might help more. If we're talking gear-wise, I mean, more armor and, and more accurate artillery uh, for our missions up in the Kupiansk area. Like we would have a, a map with just kind of like reference points, like, you know, the train tracks over here with the bombed out building over here to the uh, right flank of the position. And so if you're calling in, trying to get artillery to hit somewhere, you're just telling them that area. It's not like calling in a, an actual grid, and getting artillery sent to where you can pinpoint it. I think that if uh, if there was a way for them to get the training through foreign governments, um, working with artillery teams and teaching how to call in arty would, would would make one hell of a difference in an artillery war. Yeah, yeah, because like everything there seems to be artillery. Like seventy five percent of the casualties, both human yeah. casualties and vehicle. Um, like kills, either M kills or full kills, tend to be artillery. It seems so important that that is the best it can be. Yeah, Our artillery and mines. Um, mines is another big thing that wounds people. But yeah, if and I'd stick with that answer. If they, if they could just get their arty teams more direct, more pinpoint, I think that would really make a huge difference because – Russia's the same way. They've just got these stockpiles, I'm guessing, from the, the Cold War era. And in their mind, like, we can shoot artillery shells all day and just lob them at you and they hit wherever. And, I mean, with some of their the places they hit, like civilian markets and stuff, maybe it, they're doing that or maybe they are just trying to pinpoint it at targets of that nature. Yeah, it seems – I was speaking to a guy in the trench when I was over there and he's like, man – the Soviet Union prepared to have back-to-back -back world wars because they were convinced that was going to happen. And they just pumped right. in a heap of like cheap shit that was easy to fix and whatever. Uh, but the, the amount of stuff they just made was immense. Like while we were focusing on the technologically advanced stuff, they were like, well, you've got one of these really good things. We'll just make 50 
of these sort of shitter ones. And you see that with like the artillery, you know, they're, right. they're, they're guns and nowhere near like a one five five, you know, howitzer, but they might have 10 to one. Um, they got a bunch. That's yeah. right. And, and that's what everyone sort of talks to me about is it's like, it's accurate by numbers. Like each one is not yeah. accurate, but you fire 10,000 shells in a direction. One's hitting a target somewhere. Right. It's, 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 you know, it's an odd, it's a numbers game is you shoot enough. You're going to hit what you're shooting at. And, um, but when I went to Ukraine, when, when I arrived there last year, I, uh, I honestly was telling people, like, I think this war will be over by next winter. I'm talking about like now, right around right now. And, um, like, I really think, you know, we'll have the big push. Russia will throw like one last wave, like everything, like no holds barred, time to win it. And, and now like serving there for, for the nine months that I did, uh, my honest opinion, which I'm no strategist, but I feel like this war is going to go on for years unless, unless somebody steps in, somebody tries to put an end to it. This war is going to be an unending war for, for years to come. Yeah. And, and yeah. Why, do you, why do you feel that? Just because we're not seeing much movement that it's even or? Uh, man, the, like we were talking about the Soviet air weapons and stuff, the stockpiles that Russia has, they're, they're not going to run out anytime soon. They might have tried that that thing with the victory parade where they had that one tank rolling down the road. <laughs> but but if people think that Russia's out, people have a, a rude awakening coming. And with the line, I mean, if you look, like, if we gain a little bit of ground down near Botman area, then we're losing a little bit. And like the uh, Kupiansk area, and it's just like a, a constant back and forth to where there's no one side just pushing, 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 gaining ground, keeping it. We gain a little bit, then we lose it because we're gaining it somewhere else. Yeah, and it it's like a stalemate, pretty much. Yeah, well, that's what it looks like. You see, down in like the Zapov blast, where Ukraine's having the success near Robotini, Vabove, but then up in the northeast. Russia's having success, and it it literally seems like Ukraine will get a kilometer, Russia will get a kilometer, and it's just I think it's just a shuffle of soldiers. Like Ukraine's like right. we need to make a push, bring some soldiers down, and then of course that's weaker, and then it just it just seems so have, yeah, it just seems so stagnant. There, um, I think, yeah. When they were talking about moving us down to Bot Moon area, um, when was this? Probably around May ish. Maybe late April. I think it was May, though. But uh, like I said, that Russia had started building up troop strength near Kupiansk because uh, we would keep track of the maps. Jarvis, my the, the German guy that I had, he was my admin and CEO, and he would keep track of a lot of the maps and you know troop movements. And we're watching them build up, build up, build up near Kupiansk. And I kept saying, like, I don't think they're really going to send us to Bamu, guys. Like. Everybody relax. They're going to need us up here because what sense does it make to pull us down there when Russia's building up here? Because then they're going to need people up here. Sure enough, uh, we go down there. The When I got hit, what was it, three days later, so around the, the 11th or so, I was being moved to Kharkiv. And on the way out, we had to run up to our village in Kupians, outside of Kupians, because there's mandatory evacuation. Kupians was under evac. Um, we had to get the rest of our gear and stuff out of the village there. And because we were, you know, pulling out and giving it up. And when you're riding through Kupians, the few civilians and stuff that remained in that town, they're on the street corners waiting on these big tour buses to pull up because Russians are five clicks out. And they, they're lucky to have, you know, a suitcase with them. And, and when you see things like that, it just, that's why I say it. sometimes the strategy confuses me because we gain a place just to give it up. Um, kind of like the hills in Vietnam. It was so important to capture this hill and then they'd capture it. And then, you know, a week later, nobody's on that hill. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It, and I think there's a lot of strategists around the world scratching their head being like, what, what is going on here? Um, you know, why aren't we focusing in one area and trying to make a breakthrough down to 30 ounce uh, Melitopol where 
people have thrown other strategies to like because we can sort of happen like we in buck mood and grind down the enemy without actually having to take much ground but it it's one of those i think that's a big gamble like i think there's a big gamble on uh gambling that russia is going to run out of political will men artillery and bullets um i i think that i think of course we don't we don't have all the information available to us you know this is top, yeah. top secret stuff but but just my gut feeling is like russia prepare, they they're so um they've been paranoid like the soviet union through to russia was paranoid that we were on their heels to invade and and was, this is the reason they invaded Ukraine was they were paranoid that Ukraine was going to become NATO and next thing we're in Moscow, which you and I both know is never going to happen. Yeah. But I'm like, they just built so much shit um, that it may suck, but there's so much. And it's, if North Korea get involved, people we like to laugh at North Korea, like especially like America, because it's like, oh look, we have five thousand nukes and they've got one shit one. But they, North Korea, a dictating state, a, dicta a state with a dictator, they can just mobilize everyone to just build shells. Like this, that's the one thing that like America can't do. If America was like, everyone go in and build shells, 50% of Americans would be like, fuck off. <laughs> like, yeah. like where, you know, North Korea, you know, that's getting sorted out now. And that could fix a lot of Russia's issues with supplying shells. So that could be. A problem when we're talking about just the amount of party on the front line yeah um i don't think it, it'll ever come to to bullets being a a big killer and issue in this war is definitely artillery um if other countries like you know north korea or china or somebody were to get involved that there, there would be no nothing we could do really um that's why I don't understand, like, why. I, and I, I, I get that it's much more political reasons and things like that that I'll never understand. But I, I think that people should have stepped in long ago in this war and mm -hmm. put an end to it one way or the other. Yeah. And until somebody does, I don't I don't see an ending coming anytime soon. Yeah, I, I sort of think the time to have done it was, I guess, when you first got into country, when Ukraine had the successful offensives in uh, Kharkiv, Kherson, that clear mm -hmm. way more territory than this whole counteroffensive has in the yeah. weeks. That when you had Russia on its heels, that was probably yeah. the time for the West to have stepped in and gone, right, we're pushing back now. Uh, yeah. I think the longer we leave it, the more difficult. And uh, are you in Texas or Florida now? Uh, I'm in Florida right now. In Florida right now. How yeah. How is the sort of feeling amongst, I guess, your friends and your peers and everything for this war like florida's a, a red state and it, it is red state at the moment isn't it yeah under desantis yeah. um and we know the republicans especially like desantis is very like not wanting to support ukraine any further how's like an american there do you feel that sort of um, push so man it, it, it surprised me coming home uh just seeing the amount that you don't see on the news. Um, it's, from what I understand, like my friends telling me, and they were telling me while I was over there too, that, you know, at first when I went, like it, Ukraine was on the news every night, that there was something about the war, but that it's just kind of died off. And to be honest, since I've been home, I think the only time that I've really seen anything about Ukraine on TV was like twice. And one of them was because it was when Zelensky was here and uh, going around and speaking to Congress and things. Other than that, it, it, it kind of seems like we're trying to pull the sheets over our eyes uh, because either we were afraid to get involved or whatever reason, we just don't want to see bad things on the news, something, but um, it's, it's, it's kind of been brushed under a mat here, I feel like. Right. And do you think that will affect, I guess, the elections next year? Like, do you think that's one of the big things Americans will be really like people that are pro Ukraine, pro, you can, you can be, you can be not for Ukraine without being pro Russian, I guess. Like you can just be like, I want the money spent in America. Like, I think there's a whole spectrum of support. Um, do you think that's really going to affect the way, like when you talk to people of where they're going to, 
see it? And was anyone like against you? Like when you said, I went and fought for Ukraine, were there people in like Florida being like, oh, you're a mercenary, you fought wrong uh, side, like that? I've never had it like face to face, somebody like approach me with it. Um, but online, on social media, definitely. Um, I, you'd be surprised at the amount of, of Americans that don't, you know, want me over there. Don't think the you know, comments like that the real war is going to happen here back home, buddy. The problems are here. Yada, yada, yada. Uh, the mercenary thing, of course, a lot, a lot of people, which, and I'm just talking about people in general, like foreigners, mostly that, that bring up the mercenary thing, say that I'm over there doing it for money. And uh, when, when I was a broker, you know, a good month, I could make about eight grand a month. Uh, that's, that's like 2000 a week. People don't understand when like the Legion, I made about $3,300 a month. And out of that $3,300, like you're, you're paying for your, your gear, your, your fuel, anything like that. So at the end of the month, you're lucky to have a couple hundred dollars left. And with the American people, I, I believe that the majority the majority of the side that don't want us over there, don't want anything to do with it. I don't think that it's too huge on like one side or the other. A lot of them aren't well versed in either side. Um, I think it's more of a, after the 20 years that we spent in Afghanistan and, you know, the, the 11 or something I ride, they're just afraid to get roped into another war. And that's their main concern is just trying to keep us at a peace time here. Yeah. And I get that. Like, you know, you think about America in the past 30 years has basically been at constant war. Um, yeah. and I can, I can completely, you know, you have first Gulf War through Afghan, everything. I can completely get people being like, we just want a fucking phase where we're not at war. And yeah. I get people too, who may not be that versed in this. This is a lot more scary war than like Afghanistan, you know, way more scary of like mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you know, that, that war, that war was not coming home, not, not in a big way, at least, you know, that the Taliban were not going to have a nuclear weapon to, to hit a city where I can see right. where now I agree. Also, I'm on the side that nuclear weapons are not going to come into play in this, but it's pretty easy to scaremonger on that side. And I think we'll see so much more of that. Um, but to become versed in this, like, 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 you know, you and I both follow this pretty closely. Once you sort of start scratching the surface, you realize how deep this runs and you, you realize it's back to 1991 and 2014 and all this. You're like, holy shit, this is so confusing of what's going on. <laughs> I, uh, with Americans though, in, <clears throat> in this war, I get that people want to phase and, and yet yeah, we have been at war for a long time, but like the reason I was able to get out of the Marine Corps and, and I was, I was fine being done and then went to Ukraine is because for the first time in a long time, I believe that this is a war that we should be in. Um, this is, you know, a, a just cause. This is a foreign aggressor. This is somebody's boundaries being broken. And it, it's all the things that, that me as a Marine, I, I was taught to stand up for. And that's why, you know, when the opportunity came and I could do it, I went and did it. And I wish that more of the American people, more and more the, the global community would just see that this this is an unjust thing happening. And that if we don't stop it now, it might not be our war today. And that's here in the U.S. But I assure you, a year and a half from now, it'll be your 15-year-old son that's now 17 and he's going to end up going. And yeah. that's why I think that, that people need to stand up and just get it the end. And it, is that something you think that the media get wrong? Like, is there anything you see that people like me or, you know, online creators or the mainstream get that get wrong that you see that you're sort of like, that's just not correct? Uh, like, like what, what part are you asking? Uh, ju just like in the reporting you see, like mainstream stuff. Is there anything you see that you just like, that's just incorrect? Like where, where you think they're not versed on, on a particular subject? Uh... Not, not that I can grab one like off the top of my off the top of my head. Uh, I, I think that a lot of stuff isn't covered as much. Um, I think that 
you know, there's there's way more atrocities and things being done uh, by by the Russian Federation that that isn't covered as much for some reason. I don't know if it's. I mean, I know the news, and the news likes to put on negative things because you know something bad happening gets viewers. But uh, I think that a lot of it is kind of turned away from, if you will, because we want to put bad on the air, but we want to don't want to put too bad on there, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny that it needs to still be palatable, and I find this too. Like, I, I wish I could show the war. Like, when I was there filming, it's like, what I'm seeing, I can't put out. Because if I put out these videos of these dead bodies and this happening and that there's fucking chaos and what's happening. If it's not palatable, a lot of people won't like watch and relate. So you sort of need to wear it where it is and bad news sells bad news sells than good news. Like if I put up a video tomorrow that said Ukraine got this village or I put a video that said Ukraine just lost all this Pe people would re react more to that. And the meat, that's how the media get paid now. Like that. It's yeah. With with yeah. being paid off clicks, that that's how it gets paid, and it's it's sort of driving that extremism too to one way, like extreme bad news, right? And I I just think a lot's covered up, man. And so be it. I was only in one small area of the front, like I, I you know, I, either I was here or there. I put me in both places, but um, I, I feel like a lot more is going on in the front and just stories of me with guys that I served with at a point, but now they're with a GUR unit or they're over here with, you know, a different battalion, just hearing stories from different parts of the front and, and how things are, are being prepared for and things. I, I feel like a bunch is going to happen soon, but not enough to do anything. If that makes any sense at all. Yeah, no, it does. It does. And I get told similar, like, yeah, next week we're going to have big things, but it's like, but it's not enough. Like it needs to be massive. What needs to happen? Like just a decisive action. Everything falls to wall. Um, you need a, need a D-Day. You need a D-Day. Literally. Um, And at the pace you, so if you add up the average pace Ukraine has been moving in the past four months, it's going to, I think it was 2086 or something is the year that it's actually going to be able to clear that territory at that pace. And it's, now I know, I know that wars, you know, it isn't just grinding one pace, but it's like, yeah, you can't have 0.01% cleared in three months. Like it needs to, and I keep waiting. Like every day I'm thinking today's going to be the day of like a D-Day style, decisive full up, up the front. But I think there could be a, a holding back too of a D-Day action like that in such a public war. There's going to mm -hmm. be catastrophic um, casualties too. That will it be so bad that the media gets turned away? Like it's at that upper echelon. If you're Zelensky, you're those guys sitting there. You've got to balance this impossible balance of winning the war, maintaining PR. Like that's hard. Like you've got to push through somewhere. But if you have too many casualties, too many PO dubs, then it like it's it must be such a tight balance on that. Right. Right. You, you got to, it's, it's a war and you got to sell it. Yeah. If you're going to have kind of backing in it, then you have to, you have to show it's bad enough where I need help, but you got to show it's like, I'm doing what I can though. Yeah. yeah. You, you mentioned about like these atrocities and you went there to Ukraine basically because you saw an atrocity as far as, um, yeah, you said the uh, children's hospital, I believe being hit. Mm -hmm. Um, did you, come face to face with any of these atrocities, mass graves, stories of torture, things like this? Um, I, that's one thing that I can't honestly say. I never came into, into contact with it. Um, just like the, the market in Kosatinivka that we used to go get blinis and uh, schnitzel. Schnitzel and blinis every day. It was like the one little, my, my little taste of like normalcy. And um, I was home probably about two or three weeks. And it's, it's a big civilian market. I mean, there, there's, you know, shops out there that sell everything from trash bags and socks to military gear. And uh, Russia hit that. And allegedly it was, you know, a 
planned attack. But it's just things like that that in, instead of Russia picking military targets, which there's tons of them around that area, instead of them picking something that will do some structural damage to the military and help the war, they would rather try to hit a market and and cause mass civilian casualties. So I'm, I'm lucky enough to have not come face to face with any of that while I was there. Yeah. Did you ever get a feeling of like, oh shit, like the, the mix of military to civilian is a bit, bit far. Like I know in, um, uh, Kramatorsk when there was the restaurant hit and people talk about it, I'm like, yeah, but if you, like I'd been there multiple times and it was 90 five percent military there was there ever a feeling you had of like you know you're being held up in a uh building in a civilian area or whatever you think shit we might draw fire onto the civilian population here yeah um yeah like like i was the the market because it's you know there's still a big civilian population in that area but with with the troop movements and and people nearby like it's a huge military population now and uh, just being in places like that, you, you start to realize, like, this is a really good target opportunity. Um, when we first moved to that area, when we were getting ready to do the assaults in Nabotmut, uh, we were staying at an uh, abandoned elementary school and um, lots of civilian buildings right around it. And after about being there for like a week, week and a half, we had SBU come to us and literally say that like, look, we've gotten word that this has been targeted. Um, somehow they know that you are you know, foreign volunteers in this area. So we have to just tell you that we heard that it's been targeted. So we spent about an hour or two <laughs> packing our crap and we got out of that elementary school. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Now, between like your service of you know, signing up to go and threat your combat experience and then getting injured and coming back. Did any of your opinions on Ukraine shift with any moments? Yeah. You had like a shift of opinions or loyalty or anything that. I love them. Love them even more. Um, yeah. The Ukrainian people are, are strong. Um, of course you'll, you'll always have in, in any war in any population, an outsider will be looked at as an outsider. So you'd have those occasional people that they didn't really care for you, even though you're there to help them. But the majority love the fact that you're there, love the fact that you're willing to volunteer to help them to, to win their cause. Um, it's, it's a beautiful country. Um, I, I love it. I love Ukraine. I would love to go back there. Hopefully I think it'll be, probably about towards the end of winter before I venture back. I'm not looking forward to, to healing up and then going and sitting in a frozen trench. So I, I might stay, you know, through the winter, but um, if, if there's still a war there and there's a need, then then I'll be there to to try to fulfill it. Yeah. Well, that was actually going to be my next question is once you heal up, are you, are you looking at, at heading back across? Yeah. Uh, my guys, the for the majority have all taken a break right now. Uh, right. They've gone to their home countries to go see family um i i do plan on going back um at first i was just going to wait like a month or so i was going to you know put a lot of, of strain on myself and i was just going to jump back over there and do whatever i could but after being home for a couple of weeks talking to my guys you know and they're they're each of their different countries i believe that probably around you know late february early march is when i'm going to venture back out yeah. Oh, that'd be good once you, we'll link back up, I guess, once you, once you're headed back across and see where you end up. Yeah. I'm sure there'll be a war for you there, mate. I can't see it ending anytime soon. <laughs> yeah. Now you mentioned before that Konstantinivka, um, when that market was hit, was mm -hmm. that the same, uh, attack there that was rumored to be the Ukrainian, uh, book missile? Uh, you're talking about just a few weeks back, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that yeah. was the hit. Oh, I, I'm guessing. No, I, I, I'm not for sure. Um, this was probably like three weeks back, four weeks back. Yeah. No, like, yeah. And oh, was, was that the attack you were talking about in Constantinople when you were around or? 
No, I wasn't there. I just got home. That that was the market that we used to go to whenever we had time, so we'd go eat. And just seeing something like that uh, kind of gave me a wake up when I got home. Like, holy crap, I'm there every other day. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And, and how's everything been? I guess psychologically for yourself um, now that you're back. You know, you spoke in the beginning about this of of seeing that other Ukrainian gentleman. You know, when you're in the trenches, like looking up and like yeah. drone. How how <laughs> you had any of that? How how's that? Um. Not really, like drone wise. I, I sleeping was rough at first. Um, confusion when you'd wake up. Like I'd, I'd have dreams, where like I and not like dreams about getting shelled or anything like that. I'd have dreams of just sitting around with my guys, bullshitting, and uh, you know, laughing, carrying on. Then I'd wake up, and I wake up, and I'm in a strange place. I don't know where I'm at, and then where are my guys at? Uh, there were a few panic, panic nights or panic moments when it came to things like that. Um, other than that, <laughs> there was a car that backfired the other day that caught me off guard. You know, just anxiety, nerve type things. Um, but for the most part, I'm I'm doing good. Uh, it's good being home. I'm just trying to enjoy it. Yeah, oh, it's good, man. And, and how did you see it amongst the other? both the foreign fighters and the Ukrainian fighters, was there a bit of a, um, like was the, was the toll of the war wearing on them? Like it's been a long war and very intense, that trauma, is that sort of building up? Uh, with the foreign fighters, it's, I mean, there, there's a high turnaround rate because you know, you get the guys that come in that, that have either been in the military and they're, country and then they, they are so sure about what they're getting into um and the guys that want to play video games so they come in they will go out on a mission or get that you know one hit that was just a little too close and kind of shook the wall and they realize like i don't want to be here and they leave mm. uh for the ones like most of my team um people that have been there for a while uh the war is just the war and in, until it's until it's over with i, I don't think anybody's going to give up on it um with the ukrainians as well I, I don't see any any you know anything done to their resolve that has been negative in any way yeah oh good man oh man i'm glad i'm glad you're doing well and you know every, everything's sort of on the onwards and upwards How, how's the healing up is that going all right it's going great. Um, the the hole is peeled over. The knee is pretty much good to go. Putting a lot of weight on it hurts. Still got a light, slight little limp, but that's about it. Yeah. Oh, good shit. <laughs> Getting back to it. <laughs> and is that being is that covered under like VA or something? Are you? I, I can go to the VA and get seen. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Well, mate, is there anything we haven't touched on that, that you'd like to like to have touched on? Uh, not really, not that I can think about the guys that I got. I mean, a, a great group of guys out there, uh, volunteers that come in. Uh, the one thing that I do wish that could change is, um, like I, I've got a, I've got a guy, he was my platoon combat medic that, uh, you know, he's had some slight psychological problems adjusting, coming home. Uh, he was not prior military before Ukraine. He was a paramedic. And um, he was one of the, I, I told you about that position that got overran and captured by, by the Russians. He was on that mission. So he's seen, you know, some heavy fighting. He's seen the Russians face to face. He's had to end lives right in front of him. And uh, then when they go home, they don't have any kind of coverage. You know, he don't have a VA to go into. He don't have somebody that he can go get medication to help him sleep and things like that so if if there's one thing that i could get across and that this podcast might help me in any way is that uh, i wish that there was some kind of coverage for the for the foreign fighters whenever they go home yeah it'd be interesting with that like where that policy actually whose policy is not should it be under ukraine should it be under yeah Yanks? exactly with anything of this so like of tangled confusion, but but mm -hmm. uh, that that is an issue. And and one thing you deal with after wars is you start losing guys off the battlefield. 
that you didn't have to lose. And that's why I just, I think some kind of coverage or some kind of help, whether it be Ukraine or who, mm. uh, that definitely needed. Yeah. And I, and as you know, as a, as a veteran, I guess, of, of the American military as well, you lose significantly more guys post conflict than during the yeah. conflict. Um, yeah. Way, way more. Um, we way lose more. more every year, every year yeah. than we did in the 20 years of Afghan war. And I'm guessing the States is the same. Um, yeah. And that, that is good. There was an article today actually from the Kiev independent about, about this, about like the psychological aspect on young Ukrainians of what's going on. Like, and it's not yeah. just the dudes on the front line hitting it out. It's everyone. And they're not sleeping Every- 18 months now, almost two years, it's going to be up in two years of being in a high stress environment like this. That's wearing. And if you're like a kid through to whatever age, that has a lasting effect. And, and you know, that, that affects a community as a whole moving forward. Like even if the water end tomorrow, there's big fucking problems. And how, how do you do that when it's a whole country of has been put into that, that trauma? Yep. That, that the stress and never knowing when it's going to happen. And for civilians, for kids, that's, uh, that's something that I wouldn't want to carry around. I can tell you that. Oh man, man, for bloody, for sure, for sure. Especially with no end in sight, you know, and so much, so much you don't know what's going to happen. Like you, your life is sort of in limbo of like, well, is the year you eventually going to kick us out? Is the support going to dry up? Like, you know, it's so much, there's so many unknowns too. Look, there's so many, it's so wearing as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's different. It's different. And now that it looks like funding and stuff might start getting a little bit harder for them to get, I don't know. I don't know the next steps that this war is going to take. Yeah. I think it'd be very, it'd be so interesting, man. It's, it's only in the past, I reckon 10 to 14 days, the media shift on Ukraine has been dramatic. Like there's been, it's just felt this shift about, I guess, uh, money support, whatever. Um, it, it, I don't know if I'm just reading into this, but it's felt like there's been a shift and, you know, Ukraine can't afford that shift. Like Zelensky said himself, like if the support stops, we lose. Um, yeah. You know, and I knew guys moving javelins and stuff into the country um, by contract. And that was like, man, they, these aren't going into storage. Like we're not moving them in, in the storage. We're handing it to a dude to a day later, a few days later, yeah. it's been, it's been clapped <laughs> off. Like, like, you know, yeah. it, it's not that there's some yeah. big warehouse full of shit somewhere. It's point oh. A, point B. And once you were to lose that initiative to get it back would almost be impossible. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it's got to keep flowing. If, if we cut off the lifeline, then um, you cut off the lifeline and the life is going to end. So yeah. unless they keep getting the support, and I would personally say more than they've been getting is what they need. Then, uh, like like we've been saying, that the war's not going to end anytime soon. No, no. Well, Danny, mate, I really appreciate your time, man. Um, thanks, thanks so uh, much for chatting with me. My pleasure, man. It's been a it's been a pleasure. Oh, um, if there's anything I can ever do, or anybody I can put you in contact with, let me know, man, and um, I'll get you those photos, videos over to you. Okay. Awesome, man. Now, is there anything you need to plug anywhere people can follow you, support you, whatever, if you'd like? Not really, man. Um, I would just say, hey, there's there's a lot of organizations out there that that, that gives help to soldiers on the front, um, to, to volunteers, specifically uh, people that don't have to be there. Um, anybody that wants to get involved, by all means, uh, there's a protective volunteer, ghost concepts, places like that. Just uh, know the organization that you're getting a hold of, though. Don't just start throwing money out there to anybody. Yeah, yeah, for sure. There's a lot of um, lot of bullshit artists out there, mate. Yeah, that there is. Easy. Well, brother, look, anytime um, you want to chat, whether online, offline, whatever, you, you guys, just let me know. You've got my number. Definitely, man. It's been it's been great. I appreciate you talking with me. Ah, right, thanks, brother. I'll speak to you soon. All right, have a good one. Thanks. Bye-bye.